Welcome to this Screen International Talk presented with NEON. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm a contributing editor at Screen International. I'm also their Nordic correspondent. So of course, it has to be that one of my favorite films of the year is The Worst Person in the World. I'm thrilled to be joined here today by the director, Joachim Trier, uh, who also wrote the script alongside his very frequent collaborator, Eskil Vogt. So we have Eskil and Joachim here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thanks for having us, yeah. Uh, Eskil, I want to start with you because recently I saw a Polaroid picture <laughs> of you and Joachim um, looking slightly different than you do today. You were about 19. So can you tell us how the pair of you met and then how you started collaborating? Well, we were friends before we were collaborators, and we we actually met uh, during. Uh, we both had this very, can we say, stupid job at Norwegian Television, Joachim, like the very low level entry camera assistant job that was called cable puller. <laughs> uh, we just moved the cables around for the cameras and uh, to uh, not be in the way for the for the cameras. Really easy job. And we met their uh, Norwegian quiz show. And in the Norwegian television, they uh, it's a big, it's a very uh, like big hierarchy. So we had lunch, not with the camera persons, but with, with the camera assistants. So suddenly we were like, okay, who's this guy? And, uh, and then during lunch, we just found out, okay, he likes the same movies. He likes the same books. He likes the same uh, philosophers we were uh, and uh, and we just uh, started to hang out together and the way you can when you're teen in your teens you just have room for that to become like almost like instant best friends and uh, like a week later we were we were just hanging out watching VHS tapes uh, all night together and uh, and uh, discussing films and uh, I think the most important thing for me meeting you Kim was I met it was the first time I met someone else who wanted to make films, who shared that dream of becoming a filmmaker. And uh, since I'm not from a filmmaker background, that was so important to me because suddenly that dream felt uh, felt real to me when I started talking about it with Joachim. Wow, and now it's an Oscar-nominated screenwriting collaboration. Um, Joachim, why do you think you and Eskel work well together? Or could you tell us a little bit about how you work together? Because I think anybody who's a co-writer does it in a different way. How do you guys do it? I think it's one of the, that now that I'll sound like I'm bragging here, but I think one of the qualities that we share is the stamina to stay in the room together for a long time. Like we go in every morning and we sit there until, you know, five in the afternoon and some days- This is the room, by the way. Dated. This yeah, is the room. room. We are in that room where Eskil is at the moment. Uh, and, and basically the, the, we sit there together as friends and procrastinate and talk about movies or life and out of that energy comes ideas and out of those ideas comes the screenplay so we actually sit together and i think a part of it is not avoiding like we put away our cell phones and we we, we talk and we are in there together discussing what is great in cinema at the moment who are great filmmakers that inspire us why is no one watching Paul Masursky movies anymore? And let's for the next two weeks watch one each evening and, and come back and talk about them more. You know, we can nerd out a lot. And at the same time, a continual curiosity about character and how the screenplays work and what's an interesting concept for a scene. And so it's about being in that room together. Um, and then at some point we... Um, yeah, we, we have structure. Sometimes we de develop several things, but at some point it's my responsibility to make up my mind a bit and say to Eskil, listen, aren't, don't we agree that this is the, the way we're going? And we have always agreed. And then Eskil starts writing out the screenplay and then he's, we send it back and forth. But Eskil is a much better writer than I am and uh, much more sort of, you know, he has that. So at that point we planned out the structure and the scenes and and it, it goes qu fairly quick at that point because we know what we want. I think many people watching this will know you from past films together, which maybe are slightly different tone. Films like Reprise, uh, Oslo, August 31st. 
um, sort of, you know, quieter dramas still exploring relationships, but um, Thelma, which was a supernatural, had supernatural thrills to it. This film looks at romance. At, did you sit down and say, let's think about romance? Or did that just start to emerge when you were talking about all these ideas? It's, it's a good question, it, a bit of both, but I think we consciously felt that to make a love story, which went formally and tonally from the sense of levity and fun and enthusiasm and, and, and romantic dreams of a young person like Julius at the outset, and then going through a sense of loss and groundedness to become more aware of what, how you negotiate a relationship to others, but also to yourself. Like that journey of, of a piece of a life came up at some point out of our individual ideas of single moments. And, and we kind of realized that maybe we're old enough and have enough experience of both the good and the bad of life and love to, to finally take on such a sort of um, a subject matter which is always in danger of becoming cliched talking there are a million films made about love you know so I think we felt that we were ready what, what do you think Esco? Yeah I, I think you're right it was something that was on the table quite early that idea that uh, I mean maybe it's the time to make uh, a story about love and relationships and could we do it in a way that felt real because there's so many movies about romance that are very simple in a way and and reality or at least in our experience and the experience of people around us is not that simple you know usually it's just a story about two people who are meant for each other and it's just like circumstantial obstacles keeping them apart and when they meet you have the impression that they live happily ever after and that's not a story that we recognize from our lives or the lives of people around us we we felt well maybe we could do something and like really pay homage to the to the movies we love that are good in that genre but maybe add a little bit more of what we felt was real and true to that genre and I, and I think also being in our 40s is kind of a good age to make a movie because you about almost about any drama because you are like in a way midway in life and you still remember very vividly how it is to be young uh, but you also can project yourself into the future and dying and death and whatever and you know your time is limited which you don't really know when you're uh, in your 20s you know so so we felt we had like the ability to find that you can see life playing itself out in a way and uh, could a story about relationships and time passing which is actually one of the themes in the movie could that be the right moment to do that and it felt to be the right moment because this was the idea that kept adding small ideas and and, and uh, that came alive to us mm. um i know you're you're both very sensitive to the fact that you're men writing a central female character and a lot of people have said how real she feels um, I mean, how did you, did you stop and think, oh, wait, you know, are we allowed to write a, a female character like this? Or you sort of gave yourself permission. And maybe you can talk a little bit about why you felt the freedom to write. Yeah. Her, no, it's, it's a question that has come up more than I had expected, but it's not a bad question at all, actually. I, I, I guess it makes sense. The irony is that when we made our first sort of three films together, Reprise, Oslo, August 31st, and Louder Than Bombs. They were primarily about main protagonists or main characters that were male. And a lot of people were saying, well, you're interested in drama and why don't you have a, a, a female protagonist or a lead character? So we were like, yeah, 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 of course. You know, at some point, you know, we will encounter that person in our mind that we want to talk about. And we did with Thelma and we did with Julie. Um, and by that time, the idea of representation and the consequence of making something that represents who you are became very strong in our culture um, for reasons that are very relevant, for reasons that 
people have been kept out of being able to make movies. And we are uh, grappling and, and, and working on that as a film community. So I sympathize with the question of, of, of asking, you know, should men make films about movies? But, the, my, the, but I think, of course we have to. Of course, film is also about empathy and curiosity and being interested in behaviors of all kinds of characters that are, in a, I think, very liberating way, not just who I am. I have to write sometimes about things that are quite different than exactly who I am, but I might still find identification, you know? We talked a lot about that, not... So in a way, the, the, the challenge was upped. It was more exciting and, and more difficult and, and, you know, like, let's nail this. Let's talk to people. Let's, let's be good observers of those aspects of her character that deals with being a young woman. But there's a lot of Julie that, that I know both Eskel and I can identify with and that I think are more sort of general human traits of an existential nature. So I hope that both those levels of her work, you know, that's all we can do as, as artists. We try our best. Yeah, and for the record, I if we say men can't write women, then women can't make films about men and that's just silly. Uh, so I'm glad <laughs> you've made this. I'm glad um, you say that. Yeah. Eskel, I'm gonna go a little bit Oprah here. Who, which one of you two is more like Julie, do you think? Is it traits from both of you? Is it nothing like either one of you? What do you think? That's uh, that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I, I think, like Jörgen said, we recognize ourselves very much in all our characters and yeah, and some parts of it, we try to project ourselves into something that's different. And uh, I, I know what we, I mean, I don't know who identifies the most with Julie, but I think we both feel very connected to that period of time, like your late 20s, early 30s, trying to find your place and figure out what you're going to do with your life. And also the question she struggles with, you know, when's the right time to have a family or should I have a child? And at what point this, this is something that that's been a part of 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 my life and uh, and uh, and I think of a lot of people's lives. You know, it's it. Uh, I I think what we kind of circle around in a lot of our characters is those main choices. I mean, we give ourselves very narrow categories to kind of define the meaning of our lives, and it's family and children, careers, and our love lives. They're like dominant and you're usually failing in at least two of these categories and it's very hard to, to, to negotiate them. And I feel that's, that's really what we identify with uh, Julie's struggle is to really uh, nail that. And of course, there's some other aspects like having found your thing quite early, which Axel represents and that she envies. That's, that's a big part of Joachim and I because we kind of found our thing when we were in our teens. And, uh, but we've seen people around us, very close to us of both genders or all genders who just really uh, have that same ambition, the same, they, they really want to succeed in life. And they didn't have that outlet, they didn't know. And we, we have seen on people close to us what a toll that can have. Or even when you fail, if you have your dream, and you don't make it, you know. So, so I don't know if that answers your questions, but uh, but uh, that's uh, yeah. You can you can add if you have anything. Oh, you, Julie. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, what I would say is I I I, I agree with you, Eskel. It's such a moment by moment thing to write a character, and you like an actor as a writer, you also have to be in their shoes, all of them, at those points to be able to create the dynamic of what's going on between them. We, we also have to like find a way to understand Julie's father, even though he's a rather silly character <laughs> to some degree, you know, like you got to put yourself in their shoes to, to write them well, to write them real. But I, I think there's some theme in the film that we talked about early that I, I know I identify with, and I think you do as well, which is the, the great expectations, uh, the sense of dream, like how you uh, define a sense of self, not only from the real events in life, but also from that big, big, big imagined thing of 
oh, maybe there'll be that X that you'll end up with, or maybe I'll find something else in my life, or maybe, you know, all those maybes that keep living in your mind probably until we all pass away, which is a sense of self, which is a sense of identity that we are never able to quite live out. I think that's a very human thing. I think Julie is someone who's really almost admiringly believing that she can be a chameleon and change her identity. And, and if we had judged her and made fun of her, we wouldn't be able to write an interesting character. So I think there must be something, and maybe this goes for a lot of creative people and storytellers and filmmakers that, that we do admire the dreamers and the kind of silliness of believing you can reimagine yourself. I think that's something that we, 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 we try to take serious and not just make fun of. Mm. I mean, we do have such empathy for Julie watching this and of course that's down to the script, but it's also down to this brilliant casting of Renata Rinsva, who won Best Actress in Cannes um, and is now in the awards conversation. Um, Welcome. can you tell us, did you, did you always sort of have her in mind? Cause she had a, a few lines in one of your previous films, but not a big part. True. Yeah, she she played a, a, a part with uh, one or two lines in Oslo, August 31st. It, we thought it was only, are we going to the party or something? But then it turns out she ad-libbed something driving into a pool in the background that some journalist figured out. No, it's actually, she also said, I have water in my mouth, made my nose, I believe. So two lines. Anyway, so I liked her. I thought she was fun and cool and really gifted. And we kept watching theater plays and we talked about her. Both Eskel and I thought she was really great. And she was always cast kind of as the antagonistic, beautiful girl in a TV show or like something like smaller parts that didn't really give her that that sense of, of complexity that she could pull off. So we decided to do it, to write her something. And it's kind of a privilege to work in a country like Norway, where we're not, how do you say, financially cast contingent. It's not like I have to find a known actor or star to get money to finance the film. It comes more from a sense of investment in the filmmakers behind the camera. And the team that we have built sort of a rapport with, with Norwegian audiences and financiers around Europe. So we're very grateful for that. And then we could actually say, haha, we have a discovery. We have Renate. I never doubted her. I knew how good she was. And I'm so pleased to see her being BAFTA nominated and, and winning in Cannes and all that stuff. It's really wonderful. Well deserved. She's great. And what um, can you talk about the process of actually, you know, shaping this character even more with her? I mean, did she start to bring in oh, her own personal experience of, oh, I went to a party like this and I wouldn't have said this like Julie does? Or, you know, how did you actually even further develop that character once she was in there rehearsing with you or or even on the shoot? Yeah. I mean, we have a method we, we always do, which is that I, uh, I, I spend time with all the eight performers, also individually, get to know them, get to find out how I at best can stimulate and, and help and support their performance and try to let them take over the character. And then we, we film it and, and Eski looks at all the performances shot on tape and gives me kind of feedback on it, which is great. And, and, and sometimes out of that comes um, I can, I can, and both Eskel and I, we're not precious about the words. We are precious about themes and intentions and, fun and the, the truth and lack of a less pretentious term of the scene, the truth of the scene, you know? So we are okay about rewriting stuff and, and changes. So beat by beat, rehearsal day by rehearsal day, the actors will come with smart inputs. They will be better the dialogue. Um, and they will also make dialogue we wrote function better. You know, it's, it's a back and forth a bit. So I wouldn't say, I mean, most of our intentions and words are the ones that were written in there, but you know, they add truth to it. And also we uh, are interested in a kind of filmmaking where the, you know, how should I put this without sounding too much like I'm ripping off Godard's notion of, of documentarism, but but you know we uh, we believe it's it's also documentation of of, of actors like Anders Danielson Lee, who who's been one of the leads in Reprise and the lead in Oslo August thirty first, has aged with the screenplays and the films that Esco and I have, have done, and he um and we can see that there's something outside of our control, which is his moment at that time ten years ago or fifteen years ago that that's at play in the film. This is the wonderful thing about filmmaking. So erasing 
the divide between the performance and the human being in the performance. I think that's what we're very curious about. Not because we believe that realism is the only way to make film stylistically, but rather that there is something fun about the actor experiencing some event in themselves that might be even mysterious to them in front of the camera and for the audience to interpret that through the lens. That's kind of what films can do and you can't quite do in different, it's different in theater and books or, you know, that's a film thing, that unique moment and that and, day and, and age it, you can watch later. And the kind of moments of truth that Joachim creates with the actors uh, also, I think, allows for those kind of very stylized moments, like when the world stops in, in Worst Person in the World, which, in, in a way, is a complete rupture with the realism up to that point. But since you're so invested in the characters, you, you go with it. You go with that moment. And that, I think, uh, can access even another level of truth, which is the truth of how she feels inside. You know, it's not behavior, which is what usually is interesting in scenes, but suddenly you open her up and you get the feeling that she has inside of wanting to, to explore that new love and, and running away from the old relationship, which I think is, uh, I, I love that, that uh, contrast in a movie that you, we, we try not to get stuck or confined by realism, even though we love truth in acting, truth in situations, we want it to, to tr we want to try to push it a cinematic uh, higher place in a way. And, uh, and we feel we need to take those risks to be interested. And, and sometimes we probably fail, but at least we, 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 we try. Well, I think this film is certainly no failure. Uh, lots of truth, but like you said, those cinematic moments, I still tell people my favorite scene in film for a few years is this party scene where she, she's flirting. Um, it's wonderful, <laughs> magical. Um, I wanted to say a big thank you for my, the best people in Norway joining us to talk about the worst person in the world. Um, from the cable pullers to Oscar nominees, um, huge congrats uh, on the success of the film so far. And we thank you so much for telling us a little bit about the process of making it. And we'll be looking out to see what comes next from the friends who met when they were 19. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy.